I think we're going to kick off, unless anybody wants to, to not kick off. Um, you guys like the food? Chipotle a good option? Or? Yeah. yeah. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so we're going to kick off um, and start looking at something called controllers and views. And so we're going to start off simple building on what we did. So when we left off with intro to Rails, the last slide set, we essentially described and understood what was going on with our database and with our model. But the whole thing is that we actually want to send the information that's in the models all the way up to the browser because you want to communicate with people who are going to your site. And so in order to work with the models, we created an instance of a model, we set some attributes, we saved it, and it's saved to the database. Woohoo. But now the question is, great, I've got it in my model, but how the heck do I get my model up to the browser? We're going to jump into something called RESTful HTTP. Those are like two buzzwords in one sentence. So, HTTP is Hyper Text Transfer Protocol. Uh, the only important thing to know is that it's essentially um, it's like text messaging from one server back to a computer. And this is how the internet is run. Um, this may be news for some of you, it may not be news for you or others, um, but it's important because this is how websites work and this is how uh, Rails has to work too. So, for example, in your browser, when you type in yesterday's XKCD, you're saying HTTP, which is send me back via hypertext transfer protocol, uh, the resources for www.xkcd.com, which resolves DNS to a web server that has an IP address, and then says, give me back whatever is sitting at 1156. The server then even takes that and says, oh, you want that, builds a response, and then sends you back a bunch of HTML, CSS, Java, script, images, whatever's there. That's all you need to know about <coughs> HTTP. Well, there's a little bit more. HTTP has different verbs. It's essentially different ways of having a conversation. You can say, I want to get information. I want to post information. I want to send information back to you. I can put information, and I can delete information. Um, this one says, important Rails HTTP verb. <coughs> Head is not important, but post is. That's an error. So just be aware that those are ones that we're going to use a lot. So again, you just need to know that Rails apps work via HTTP as you're sending stuff back. So you're probably thinking, all right, so I know that my Rails app needs to work using HTTP, but I don't write HTTP. I don't even know the language. How do I implement it? So we're going to look at what it takes to implement it on an index page. You list all of your blog posts. And we're going to look at how you would show an individual blog post and only one blog post. So we're going to do this Rails generate thing again except we're going to do Rails generate controller post index show. Kind of looks like what we did before. So you're saying use the Rails tool and then generate a controller. Controller is a type of class that Rails has. And then we want that class to be called posts. We intentionally named it just like the post model, except we pluralized it on purpose. You'll see why later. And then we put in the two arguments, index and show. Those are method names that we want to be that we want to put into the class, and they'll actually show up in other places. Again, these are all the files that are generated. Some are, some of them are important, some of them are not. So yes, test unit, helper file, assets, copy. What the heck? <coughs> this is where most people quit Rails, right? You're like, this is too much. I just want to write HTML. Well. Yes, I'm fully there with you, so we're just going to keep it simple. And we're only going to look at the controller, and we're only going to look at this wrap thing, and we're only going to look at the, the weird HTML.erb files. I used to know the acronym. Embedded. Embedded. Embedded, thank you. Embedded. Yep. So you might be asking why so many files when I just want to communicate via HTTP. Isn't HTTP really simple? Yes, it is. So 
I love pictures. Fortunately, we don't have a big enough whiteboard. So put in a picture here, and this is what's happening. When your browser makes a request for the index page, which has all your blog posts that are saved in your database, it sends it here, sends it to your server, and then there's a config routes file that says, that understands where this request is supposed to be sent. And so it specifies that it's going to be sent to the post controller. The post controller then generates a response with some data in it and then sends back and it says, I'm going to send, I'm going to render my data or I'm going to push my data to the index.html.erb file. So this is the big picture of why we generated all those files. We've got a controller, we've got a routes config file, which is like an air traffic controller, it tells where an incoming request to go, and then it's serviced, and then it's sent back. We've got the controller, which is kind of doing the, um, it's implementing specific <coughs> logic, and then shoving data to different places. And then you've got these index, these HTML ERB files, which then make your web page all pretty with CSS and JavaScript. That's, that's how we're implementing HTTP. So let's look more specifically at the configroutes.rb class. Configroutes.rb has a little bit of a black magic aspect to it. Um, it can get really complex. Here's the really simple aspects of it. You're essentially saying example log colon colon application.routes.draw do. So this is your app name and you're going to the app's name, app name's application, class or module. Those are different, we'll just say class for now. You'll we'll understand that. And then routes draw do. So you're essentially saying, have these gateways open. And this, the gateways that are open are get post show, get post index. And the thing to know is that the get is a HTTP gateway that's being opened up. So it exclusively responds to HTTP GET request. So if you send it an HTTP POST request, it's not going to send. It's not going to send it to the POST controller index method. It's going to say, "I don't have that route defined. I can't do anything. I give up." You're saying POST, uh, like an HTTP POST request, but you also have POSTs. Up there, right? So, oh, yeah. Will this is put? And I think it uses post and put. It uses all the Yeah. Yeah, the one of them. So, if you were to write, uh, so this is the, we'll say this is the example dot 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 do, and you were to say post. part here, but the thing that's different about them is this, and so it's saying that you have to be an HTTP post in order, I'm only going to listen for HTTP post, whereas here, I'm only listening for an HTTP get, so it's like speaking a different language or asking for a different thing. So then, the the weird tricky thing, and this is where it feels like a little bit of black magic to me, maybe I'm just weird, but you, um, in here, you're essentially saying post, um, what's this sign called, pound symbol? Dash. 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 On the phone, it's a pound symbol. Mm -hmm. And dash. Pound hash. Is equal, when you specify the, this is the implicit version, and then here's the explicit version. The explicit version is mapping 
whatever comes in via the get post index HTTP route, it's sending it to the post controller index method. And this is one of those things where it may not be like, I don't really get what's going on. The whole idea is that <coughs> this is the URL that you're requesting, and then this is the place that it's sent, and it's sent to the post controller. So that'd be like blog.index.html or something? Yes. Or whatever the, the URL is. Um, <coughs> right, so, the, so let's say you had a, a website called example blog. dot com post index would correspond with this. You have to have a separate line for every every quote entry that they're gonna maybe hit. Yes. Um there's there's ways that you so let's say are you familiar with CRUD create up, create read update delete? So if you want to do a CRUD operation on posts, there's a way to take the like five different CRUD operations and put it in one line. Because someone said we need to CRUD a lot within Rails, so let's just create a method that represents the CRUD operations, and then we'll have all the HTTP verbs or instructions for the gateways that we need in order. So every route has to be specified. There's ways to group the gateways. And I'll show you that more when I talk a little bit more about REST specifically and how it applies to Rails later. Cool. So if you So the the route, the implicit route, it's getting the posts, so comparing that to your explicit thing. Mm -hmm. So the posts part where you then go to posts controller.rb. Yep. So if we were looking at the URL that's like example blog.com slash category slash Category, the category, category action of the controller class. Yes. Okay. As long as it was defined in here as that. Sure. Because you could you could change your routing around and you could say categories is actually going to go to post and post is going to go to categories and I'm going to confuse the heck out of my users. Yeah. Okay. It goes back to that convention of the configuration thing. You can enumerate all of those, but if you're going by best practices and defaults where your right URLs on. follow the controller action. You can pretty much just go generate all of them that before you, but you can go against the grain and find specific actions for different uh, uh, URLs to select that. So if you wanted a more interesting example perhaps would be get post index goes to post slash show slash one. So your index is only showing the first post or something like that. So you would pretty much typically only do the direct explicit direction where you're going against the norm. So then, let's say you wanted to see all the routes in your application. You could run a rate task, rate routes, which is specific to Rails, but is in every Rails application, and you would be able to see all your routes. Just kind of a nice tool. And just to, to clarify, too, so if you just head to the URL in your browser, get request, right? Yes. The browser's just get yeah. request to get the default get. Yeah. You'd actually send calls to. So that's your average just visiting um, a URL in your browser, but post might be something like if you're actually submitting a form, yep. or you can create links in Rails too. Like when you click on them, they'll send a post request to the browser. Answer. Cool. All right. So we've talked about we have this air traffic controller routes.rb, which is receiving the request and then pointing to the post.rb file says, hey, I want you to respond to this. So how does it respond to it? First of all, post <coughs> controller inherits from the application controller. And that file is down here. And application controller inherits from action controller base. This kind of looks like active record. Act action controller is actually one of those Rails gems that Rails is built off of. So all that to say, the post controller has superpowers because it inherits from action controller. So within here, we've got these different methods. And the methods are synonymous 
with something called actions. Actions are very, actions are a key term um, that when you generate links dynamically to specific resources, actions are one way of specifying which method that you're pointing to. So you can generate a link that says, I want to point to the host controller index action. And you, you, would, you describe that pointing as pointing to the index action, even though action is a method. So then you've got the, the index and the show actions. And so the controller instance methods are actions. So host um, hash index maps to you've got the index and post uh, hash show maps to the dash show method. All right, and so then this is another one of those convention things that you can that I would advise you stick with unless you have a really good reason not to stick with it. The the views that are returned or the HTML files, those are mapped specifically with the name, same naming structure as the controllers. So if you've got app controllers post controller and you've got app views post index. So index lines up perfectly with the method. And so then also here you've got the post show, post controller show action, which then maps up with the show file. And so you can see that there's kind of this whole thing where you've got a, a post controller and then you've got post views. And notice how each individual action has its own file within the post folder. And so it's very much a single responsibility type setup where each action has its own rendered HTML file. So then the ERB at the end stands for Embedded Ruby. And essentially, Embedded Ruby enables you to, um, to template, template to dynamically, that's weird. You can dynamically generate HTML code. Um, so by default, there's nothing in there, but we'll fill it in with some stuff and you'll see why ERB is nice to have. So we want to make the index work. So we want to have all of our blog entries show up on the index.html page. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that our um, config wraps.rb file is connected, which it is. We are pointing the hit post next to the post index action. And then this is something that you should be aware of. <coughs> the wraps.rb is a regular expression matched file. So if nothing matches above this with the word post in it, the very last one, get post, is a really easy match. And that will be automatic. And I've specified that I want that to be sent to the post index. So if someone's typing in on a keyboard and they type in something really goofy and it doesn't match any specific route, but it still has the post string in it, it will, by my default type set, be sent here. And so it's kind of a catch-all, like a <coughs> catch that I've implemented that I think is a better convention. So, so, okay, so this file is in so when I see RBS, it's Yes. But I guess I don't understand why. The very first line that you've got a, some, some bad draw in it. So that's actually, remember a while ago when we had great table do t? It's the same thing. It's actually a prop. It's, di it's dynamically generating basically the middle between those initial requests and how it maps to your controllers and your views. So this really is valid when you send text. Yep. Yes. So, <laughs> so it's valid Ruby syntax. The, the fact that you have a git and then you're on a string, and then that's pointed to something else, and then you've got these different things on the end. That's not your typical everyday Ruby, but it's straight up Ruby. Okay. So remember that everything in Ruby is an object, including your whole application. Your, his whole application is showing you his example of log, mm -hmm. and that has a static member called application, which is the embodiment of all the configuration of your blog, 
And within that, there's a configuration called routes. Okay. And within that, you have mappings of URLs to uh, controller actions. Mm -hmm. And that's what that draw is. is it's a hash of all those links between the URLs and where they go, basically. Is that enough? Yeah, it's just amazing to see what you can do with it. The language itself. It's yeah. Well, for sure. Yeah. I just remember really fun fact about it. Um, so then you can also do break routes, and we see that, hey, we've got these different routes that we can send to. So we've got the, we can send a get request to your posts, and we can send a get request to the post index, and we can send a get request out. Okay, so the next thing is we did the routes.rb file, and now we want to look at the controller, and so we already checked out the controller and views because we didn't change anything in them. And if we fire up our Rails server, um, and we go to these um, URLs, we get this response in HTML on the page. Um, you're just gonna have to trust me. Um, but, so, all this to say, we have correctly configured a request and response, and it happens over HTTP on your local machine. Okay, but I don't want to just some little HTML text file. I want to see my blog entries, because that's what I care about. I want to tell the world about my experiences. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do something where we actually, um, where we send back a dynamic query from the database, and we send the results of that query to the HTML. <coughs> and this is where web app development is awesome. So we've got our class post controller, and instead of having nothing in there, we're actually going to create an instance variable at post is equal to post.all. What that does is post.all is an active record thing, and it generates the SQL select post from posts. So it's essentially saying, give me all the entries from the post table, and I want you to store it in this instance variable at post. So the really cool thing is what we can do then is that this instance variable goes down into the views, which are returned as a result of the response, and we can then render or we can access that instance variable in the index.html. So this is where you can essentially query stuff in your controller actions, and then you dynamically generate whatever's coming back in your HTML files. One thing to note there is that if the at symbol in front of posts was not there, it would no longer be an instance variable. It would just be a straight up variable. And that would no longer percolate down into your ERB file. So that at symbol is important to actually let Ruby know that that variable needs to be shared with your view. Otherwise, it would just be a local variable. So we're going to take it like 20 feet farther below the surface and say, why does this work? Why? Because when we would do an ERB session, we would create a class, and then we'd create an instance of that class, and then we would set attributes to it. But then when we would shut down the ERB terminal, uh, the IRB terminal, we would lose that session. Because it was a class instance, it was, it was created, but then it wasn't saved. And so every time that your Rails app gets a request, it creates an instance of the post controller, and then from that instance it says, I'm going to create instance variables that are specific to that request so that my request to the server is totally different than your request. And this is what enables us to have like a Facebook type user login where I'll make a request to my events. And I'm going to get my set of events that I'm invited to, but I'm not going to get Derek's events that he's invited to because they have separate responses based on our logins. So this is what guarantees that the response is going to be specific and unique to each response that hits the server. It's a little bit deeper, but I just want to like broaden the horizon. So, so then, if you're interested in doing something like that, this by default won't do that unless you set up what is called a uh, model scope. We're not going to dig too far into scopes today, I don't think we But a, a scope is basically you can define that in that post.rv and say, by default, I want all the posts I receive to fall under certain conditions. 
And one of the conditions that he alluded to is you could make it only post belonging to the currently logged in user. Um, alternatively, you can do um, SQL queries with that. So post dot um, find, and then you would put in information relevant to the currently logged in user. And so there's a whole authentication, login stuff pre built that's out there because that's yeah. um, usually something you're building all the time. So I'm assuming it's part of a gem. It's or not actually built into Rails, okay. um, but there's a gem that might as well be thrown into Rails because every single Rails app I've pretty much seen nowadays is using it. Mm -hmm. It's called Devives. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Devives okay. later and how you do this. To that's, that's the nice thing about Ruby and Rails is how easy it is to pick up and drop in things like gems of your application and just like reading them in minutes. Um, that's why they don't include a whole lot of things in Rails. Nice because they don't want to blow it up too much. They just basically do the bare minimum. Are, are most gems just open source, free, off GitHub? I or don't some think I've them? seen a paid gem yet. Sidekick Enterprise. Oh, yes, I think it is. That's only 50 bucks, though. So. How do you decide between a good <coughs> gem and a bad gem? Do you know if somebody's really written some crappy or? Yes, yes. I'm Ruby. Ruby has to be very vocal about things that suck. <laughs> do they? Or okay. you can so on, radio? There's like a, a website that I use. Or? Ruby toolbox, and you can see how many times it's been downloaded. Sure. And the number of downloads kind of tells me how popular it is. So it's kind of like WordPress and its add-ons and that kind of junk. Exactly. <coughs> Since it's all open source, there's nothing about you from digging into GitHub and looking at the issue log. Right, but it has a gem's got 3,000 issues on it. They're all open. You know, we are going to know. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You want to have one. But yep. It's good. As, as you get more familiar with, last thing too is, the nice thing about Ruby is since everything's open source, mm -hmm. if you run into issues like this, there's communities out there that are ready to help you. And even if the issue's out there and it's just like, well, no one's working on it, you know, that opens up an opportunity for you to start contributing better. Sure. Too, so. mm -hmm. Yeah, and people respond on Twitter like lightning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's a very vocal. It's a nice thing about being Ruby developers and oh, yeah. being active community. I, I've been interested in it for a while, but it seems like yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of buzz about it. So we got this instance variable, it's the best thing in the world, and so now we want to actually display all the posts. And so we're gonna do this weird thing. It's kind of like um, my old school friends tell me it's from the JSP Java days. Um, I barely touched this in school. But you essentially, you put it in the um, less than percent sign, and then you put in the Ruby code, and then you say for the less than percent sign, equal says I want to render that and then it's kind of like a for loop. It says essentially a Ruby code and you're saying iterate through all the posts and render each post. And we're doing a inspect. So we want to just see everything about the object. So we fire it up and then we hit that and then we see this result. We see each of our post objects. I created a new blog entry, my journey is going to put anything else in it. And that's what's returned to me. So it's dynamically querying the database, and I get the response. And so then we can put in some more HTML to make it a little prettier. I'm essentially just adding the table, putting some um, header columns in, but I'm still doing the, the little for loop trick with the, the rendering. So this part up here is not rendered, but then each of the attributes are rendered, and you get to see it come through. So that's kind of the index. Does that all make sense to you guys, or does that, that seem weird? I guess, you know, we could get in a big debate about, um, you know, say about content, <coughs> and content. I guess it's, you know, it's got a bad ERB on it, which says, look, this is template or template generated HTML, so it's okay to do so. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, like in the PHP community, there's a lot of debates about whether they should you know, you're in a loop there, you're in a Ruby loop, but then you're saying, okay, you're generating a table, you got table definitions and all that kind of stuff. The difference there is you're not actually directly interacting with the database from the view. Right. You're leveraging that controller as the intermediary between the database. Where people tend to want to fight you is if you start putting queries in your view. Like if he was actually putting SQL in that HTML file, I'd probably walk over there and hit him in the face. Yeah. Um, it's it, people get that passionate about it.
about it. Um, it's just that whole separation of control thing that a lot of peers get really involved with. All right, so we're going to do it for another one. We'll go a little bit quicker because you guys in this one. So we want to let's configure your post <coughs> hash show to render a specific post and only one post instead of everything. So how do we identify blog entries? We're actually going to use the databases, database tables, database tables primary key. So this thing here, the ID, Rails by default says that the ID column is the primary key to the database. Um, so then how do we send, how do we specify an ID when we send a URL request to the controller? So in the URL request we need to specify it and then we need to expect it in the routes and then we gotta pick it up from the controller. So it's pretty simple to specify it for the HTTP request, you just put it here. <coughs> and in order to do that, we're gonna change some code and before this was post hash show, but we've actually changed it to get post slash um, colon ID. And what that colon ID says is that it assigns whatever after the post slash to params ID. Params is a hash that's accessible in the controller and it gives you all of your params that are sent via the URL. So for example, local post, when you put in a one, in the ID slot, it assigns params ID to one. If you did four, it would assign it to four. If you did 99, 999, it would do that. Or you can also assign it a string. It really doesn't matter. You're just saying grab whatever's there and give it to me. So we're expecting it in the routes.rb file. And now we want to grab it in the controller. And so here in the def index, we just said post all. We didn't care about any sort of search criteria. But in that show, we're saying post.find params ID. So we're saying all this is doing is generating a select post from star, select all the attributes from post, where post.id is equal to one. So you're generating a specific SQL to find only one entry. And so then the post op, the post instance variable that we're sending back is going to hold the post object that we pull from the database. We put in some HTML. And then we can render it. So it comes through, it works. And now we want to create a link between the index page and the show page so we can go back and forth so that we don't have to manually type it in. In order to do that, we can use a a Rails path and URL helper to generate the links. And so we can link to, and then we give it a string, or essentially the end evaluation needs to be a string. And then we give it a routes path, and this is what was in the rates, um, rate routes. And so we add this bit of code on the index page. We say link to, and then, um, link to the index page from the show page. So link to, this could be back or index, and then the post path. This is actually specifying the index page. And then on the index page, we're referencing dynamically each um, show page for each blog entry. And so in the post that's here, we're specifying that we want to send it to the post path. This looks kind of like it's you may be saying, why does this work? It's because Rails is interpreting this, and it's saying, I've seen that before. That points to an object, and I know what that object is because you're using specific routing rules, and then I can automatically generate your links so you don't have to do it for you. This is sometimes a little tricky. You may not see it at first. You have to play around with it, but just know that it's there. Does that create a separate field for the link, or is it actually using? Um, it just creates like an anchor tag with an href, mm -hmm. and it dynamically generates the href. So that's how you can create an index and a show action with Rails. So, so I just have a question. Yes. Did you guys able to talk? Just 
talk about how you would um, do this. So, like, uh, in WordPress, you have the option of using like a post title as the, the key for that post, mm -hmm. the URL structure. Yeah. So, say I had post, and then rather than slash one, which is the idea of that post, I wanted to, to actually write the title out. Mm -hmm. Some say that search engine like that. That would look better. Yeah. Um, you said the primary key is was the best route in which to retrieve the post. Um, or that's that's how it. That's the convention it. that we chose because okay. that's keep it simple and stupid. We can also we can also change our our query mechanism to instead of finding by ID, we can do find by whatever. We can change our SQL selector to look not for the primary ID, but to look for the author name or the content type, or to make it kind of elastic, so it's like, search for a title that's like this. So it's not limited to that, but that's the simplest case. And find, find that there's a default just for the ID. Yes, with nothing else, primary key, but just find ID. It goes to the primary key of that table. Um, I had one question. I mean, routes that show when you updated are updated to handle an ID. Yes. Um, it looked like that will basically is a regular expression except any string. So how do you stop it from going in there when you type in routes that for slash index? It seems like that would. Be. Um. Take like a five minute break and then we'll go back for last and final round. Mm -hmm. 